Hello, everybody. This is Rebecca Freedom, and this is episode number 52 of Heard Not Seen, produced by John Beethan. Today's episode is on love and sex addiction. We all have it. We all have it buried somewhere inside of us. And some of us are in denial and some of us are not. But I want to be able to start because this is this is a topic that really strikes a chord with a lot of us. And we don't even realize that our dating behaviors are exhibiting addiction. And addiction is an affliction that leads to abusive cycles and always feeling disappointed, let down, not enough, too much, unlovable, and all the other bullshit that we tell ourselves to get through life. So we are just end up being these little survival animals, these little fucking monkeys with opposable thumbs, bigger brains, and addictions to computers. Yay, go us. So to kind of get into the frequency of what I'll be talking about today, I brought my tuning forks along. I'm going to invite you to be able to take a breath and drop in because we are going to be going into some deep, dark territory of abuse and some other things that really may bring a lot up for you. If it does, I invite you to reach out to me at RebeccaFreedom.com or leave a comment below if it doesn't feel too exposing to you. All right, so go ahead and take a deep breath. Arrive into the space that you're in right now. Feel your body. Feel yourself sink in fully to this moment. And bring your attention to your breath at the very tip of your nose. And bringing your breath at the tip of your nose, go ahead and just, we're going to start the tuning forks now and let the sound radiate through your body. All right, good. I'm kind of getting a little bit of tuning alignment as we start this. Um, And I want to start with a book today written by Kelly McDaniel called Ready to Heal, Breaking Free of Addictive Relationships. This book is written specifically to women, but of course it applies to us all. So listen back to last week's podcast on boundaries and it goes over uh, our attachments, the way that we attach um, nervously, anxiously attach where we're avoidant, come close, go away. Um, Or that's rather we're ambivalent, come close, go away. And avoidant attachment is just stay away, stiff arm, don't come close. Secure attachment is where we can be expressed in the world. These of course are interrupted by the environments, the blueprints we're raised up in. So if we have a, uh, addict, an addiction, a love addiction that's rising up in us, oftentimes it comes from a boundary that was crossed. And there are two types of sexual abuse. As a culture, we are becoming more aware of sexual abuse. Yet it's still common for women to not know about the different types of sexual abuse they may have experienced in childhood. There are two types of sexual abuse, overt and covert. Forms of childhood overt sexual abuse are usually easy to identify and include the following. Actual physical penetration by an adult, which may or may not involve intercourse, fondling or masturbating a child or having a child fonder or masturbate the adult, sexual kissing and hugging, hugging, regularly inidentifiable for most adult women, being asked to exhibit yourself or being exposed to pornography by adults or much older children. Sexual abuse of a child by a relative, incest, or a person in a position of trust or authority is a violation of the child. A victim of incest usually doesn't tell the family member about the abuser or, um, for fear of being misunderstood, shut out, or to protect the offending adult. Incest can happen in many ways. Incest occurs between fathers and daughters, mothers and sons, mothers and daughters, and fathers and sons. Grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, nieces, and nephews can also be incest offenders. Covert sexual abuse is different for most women to identify. The word means hidden. It, it, in its very nature, this form of abuse is difficult to understand. Covert sexual abuse or emotional incest happens when a parent uses a child to meet his or her emotional needs. In this book, Silently Seduced, When Parents Make Their Children Partners, psychologist and author Ken Adams describes this in the following way. 
The parent motivated by loneliness makes the child a surrogate partner. The child feels responsible for the happiness and well-being of the parent. She may feel anxious, suffocated, inadequate, or aroused with this parent. Here the child meets the needs of the parent and not the other way around. I really want to emphasize that. That's such a huge thing. It's called parentification where the child is stepping into the role of adult and meeting the needs of the parent. It's self-soothing. The parent is learning to soothe the, um, the child is learning to soothe the parent rather than the parent soothe the child. Adults with their own unresolved childhood issues can easily fall into the trap of thinking that their children are there to meet their companionship needs. For example, fathers may sexualize a daughter by complimenting her on her body, the way she dresses, or by taking her special places in order to gain her attention. Mothers can use their daughters as friends, thereby neglecting to protect and guide them. When covert incest happens between a father and a daughter, a mother may grow jealous and alienate her daughter as a result. In a family system, this is profound abandonment for a young girl who in essence loses both parents. One rejects rejects hers while the other one is an overt incest survivor. Uh, And these are the same feelings um, an overt incest survivor experiences. Mostly she will shame as an adult or she will show symptoms of being an overt incest survivor, including Hasty, hasty interests and exit in relationships, difficulty saying no, trouble with sexuality, trouble identifying needs and wants, excessive worry about others, a need for constant positive affirmation from others, feeling suffocated by a romantic partner, disordered eating patterns. Interestingly enough, covert incest survivors often feel special, privileged, or unique in their families. This is because they have been given access to certain situations that are meant only for adults. Survivors, as a result, feel superior to other children their age. The special status as daddy's girl or mama's little man doesn't allow them to view this type of relationship as abuse. Confusion comes with feeling both special and shameful and the same at the same time. For this reason, covert incest is problematic for an adult woman, is difficult to name, and therefore the effects can continue for a long time, often running a woman's sexual and relational life without her understanding why. This book is an excellent book to dive into if you find yourself in the repetitive position of leading with sex in relationships where you're just guided force is get it while you can and sex becomes this false bonding of intimacy. The book goes further into saying if you have an avoidant ta- attachment style, the stiff arming of keeping people away, often you'll have more of a sex addiction than you will a love addiction. If you have an ambivalent um, attachment, you'll often be more of a love addict and be looking for the reinsurance of a surrogate type parent. So I encourage you to take this moment and really look at yourself. Like really, these are hard things. These are things that we avoid, that we cover up through what I like to call the sexual or the spiritual veneer that we, we use different spiritual languaging from life coaching to different spiritual practices to, um, as they say, chase the medicine. We chase the medicine, but we don't necessarily integrate the medicine into our lives. We can go to ayahuasca ceremonies during the weekend and have great visions and insight into our psyche and our being. And then Monday, we're just right back into that same addictive cycle. So I want to I want to talk personally about this having just come to a full circle circle and cycle in a relationship that lasted in and around three months, and um, retrospection or returning to look at the beginning of the relationship offered me the insight that when you begin a relationship with you're just on not on the same wavelength. Um, the The person I was in relationship with and came in with the model of deciding that he did not want a relationship. He very much needed to feel okay on his own in a single type environment. And I came in ambivalent, like I may or may not want a relationship. I had just finished a year of Tinder dating and it was a, how they say, shit show. So, um, so when we met each other, it felt really divine intervention because of the way we met. Again, listen to the past episodes uh, to go over that. And we slept together on the first night. So what happens when you lead with sex, if you, that you are going to instigate a sex addicted pattern. 
So the addictive pattern that happens is anxiety, doubt, and fear. There's an urgency that comes up in the body and, um, and it, it comes and it presents itself and the relationship is come close, go away. A push-pull relationship based on intensity and chaos. As one partner leans to exit the relationship, the other per- partner uh, grasps even harder. And I will say there were moments in the relationship where I started to begin to recognize we weren't in sync with each other. We we were different frequencies. And I started to lean to leave the relationship. And then he would c- cry um, crocodile tears and say, no, no, I don't want you to leave. And abandonment and fear was running the show on his part. And in my part, I was like, well, I can't just leave this person. I don't want to be the asshole here who just, I've been abandoned. I've had that feeling of abandonment. So I came in as what my friend would call a lifeguard. (laughs) He's like, stop lifeguarding these broken boys. Just stop lifeguarding. And women, naturally, we have, um, I think there's this idea of health, love healthy people. Well, none of us are fucking healthy. Okay. We all have a disordered part of us, a dysfunctional part of us. The health is through the ability, through, um, through self-esteem, um, through, through timing and through self-love, like the, the ability to actually care for and parent yourself, to partner with yourself. And a partner with yourself is the beginning of breaking these addictive cycles, meaning you have an inner child inside of you, we all do, that was hurt. And I actually was in Whole Foods um, just the other day getting my green drink, as I normally do. And um, there's this little girl with gorgeous curly hair and this like chubby face, probably a toddler, age three, and her mother, caretaker, she was jumping up and down and just having this good time. Her mother and caretaker turned around and goes, stop, stop. And you saw her face melt from the smile down. And I just went over after I got my drink. I was like, that's at least a year of therapy right there, <laughs> right there. That exchange that she'll internalize, that my joy cannot be met, that I have to stifle stuff. It just makes me, it almost breaks my heart just thinking about that, that I have to like stifle and suffocate myself to be able to survive in this world, that I can't have a voice and be fully expressed. And and in my family, I think I came in with an exuberant soul. I also came in and I died in the crib as a baby. So I think I came here and was like, fuck this shit. I said, dog, I did not want to come back as a human. <laughs> I said, rich dog, give me the, give me the palace and the, and the maids and all of that kind of stuff. But suffice to say, my mom found me in the crib. She resuscitated me and she kept me here. So, uh, what that did is I grew up as um, I was five years old before my sister was born. So I had the attention of my father and my mother. And um, as I matured in my high school years, being the first sibling, a lot of pressure was put on me to perform a certain way. My mother was always like, if you want to have friends, you need to be friendly. My dad was like, you need to leave her alone. (laughs) She'll be fine, Rose, leave her alone. So what this created inside of me was the realization that my personality, who I be, um, results in separation. Like I, if I really expose myself, if I expose my heart, that will mean that people I love will leave me. I discovered this in a session um, with Brandon Hawk, who is a incredible uh, coach. He works mostly with CEOs and CFOs to help up their game from a heart-centered space. So, Brandon, thank you for that exchange and that realization. As I share this to you, my body just gets flushed and gets hot. <laughs> it's very hot. There's a lot of a lot of energy in this. So essentially, um, at that moment in time, I inherited the blueprint or the idea that being who I really was meant people leave, people leave. And so I created all these different masks and characters, and I have a lot of them. I have a lot of masks and characters. You hear it from time to time coming out of me. (laughs) And I like to have fun with it, but I also realized 
that my representatives, as people have told me on Facebook, those those comedic parts of me or those angry parts of me or whatever, the representatives are not really representing me. They're not a good uh, measure of who I truly am, what my soul's course is here in this life. So in working with Brandon, uh, we came to this place where I found rage in my body because when you hide behind the mask or the representative, ultimately anger is going to be the activating energy that's going to try to push those out of the way so that you can shine. Anger is a masculine energy. It's an energy of get shit done, of move forward, of clear the clutter. Masculine energy in its balanced form is devotion. It's devotion and leaning in with full presence, with full penetrating presence and feminine energy at its balance is this surrender, this um, holding the yearning, the ache of the heart. And again, that's from David Data's book, uh, Dear Lover. And of course, he's got several different amazing books um, that you can look into. But again, David Data, Dear Lover, he talks about that surrender and opening that happens. But Ultimately, we learn to close off. We learn to close off, shut down, deflect, divert, project, um, be altruistic to protect ourselves. But we are more givers than receivers because it's safer to give. And here comes the addictive cycle, folks, is we'll meet people in our lives that will replicate the patterns of the things we're trying to break free from. So love addiction. Love addiction is based on the fantasy that you will be rescued by relationship. It's this dream of the prince. It's this dream of my queen, my princess. She'll cook and clean for me and give me blowjobs when I want. I will be so happy all the time because I have this person. I just need someone to hold in my arms. I have this ache, this ache inside. And it comes from uh, an unwillingness to look at the trauma, the the belief system, the structure of which you're creating your life on. Let's love sex addiction. Sex addiction is the saying that everything is about sex except for sex. Sex is about power. So sex addiction uh, often comes from being perpetrated upon by an adult where there was a sexual boundary crossing and there can be an acting out, but it is a, um, again, it is a visceral feeling of if I have this thing, then it will soothe my soul. Now, what uh, Kelly McDaniel says in her book is addiction always moves you further away from what you actually want, moves you further away. It's the short game. Addiction is the continual perpetuation of of um, feeding the hungry ghost. And the idea of the hungry ghost is um, a ghost with a pinhole for a mouth and the Grand Canyon is a stomach. It cannot be fed fast enough. And it's just, and our bodies are built for tolerance. So when you ingest a substance, if you have one drink and you've never drank before, you'll feel the effects of that pretty quickly. Um, But if you drink often, you have to drink in greater quantities to have the same effect, analgesic effect. The same is true for relationships. The consumption, you turn into this this wildly cons- consumption, transactionary relationships where it's a commodity, your body's a commodity, and you are exchanging it for a little semblance of validation or worth. Now think about the culture we're in. You can always move on to the next thing. You can just Tinder, get on a dating. It's so convenient to meet the next person and to lead with sex as intimacy. To lead with the romance, the idea of like, oh, he took me on, you know, he bought me things and blah, blah, blah. And this is how I want to be treated and swept up in the inevitable dopamine rush. But ladies, specifically women, I want to tell you about a little study that was done. There is this molecule, it's called testosterone, the idiot molecule, that actually blocks men from imprinting. So that means that when you have sex with a man, this rush of bonding molecules, oxytocin, 
um, and dopamine rush through your body and that that an indelible mark as if being branded by that man's energy enters your body and starts to circulate your body. Well, he's got something called testosterone and that doesn't fucking happen for him. It is like shields. That's why men can just spread their seed like a freaking buckshot, you know, just pow, 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 as many as possible. They're like, vaginas just open up. I don't really want to get you pregnant, but I want to practice. And, um, and so what it takes for that imprint to happen on a man is he has to hang out with the same woman repeatedly for about two to three months. And then vasopressin comes in and starts to suppress testosterone. And that's when the man can start imprinting with a woman with he and he that only happens if he does not have sex with her. So no sex for at least two months at the bare bones minimum, meaning you're going on dates with a beginning and an end. You're going not not stay over, not Netflix and chill, not come to my place. It's like, I'll meet you at the local half Whole Foods. We'll have a coffee. And then a week will go by and you'll be like, let's go to the park. Let's go walk on the beach. Let's go for a hike. Let's actually be in an active space. Um, often when you're meeting somebody, be in an active space where other people are at too. Don't really like move from the space of togetherness with other people and then you slowly get into togetherness alone and you develop the intimacy based on values on and again i'm going to offer the relationship resume up soon you'll be able to download download that once i uh, make it happen make sit down and actually make it but the, the point of the relationship resume is really to like go through the checklist of what are my values am i coming into this because i just want fun okay r- red flag red flag, like where are your intimacy issues? Intimacy into me, I see. Fucking look at yourself. My mother used to preach this to me growing up as a kid all the time, one after the next. Rebecca, look at yourself. Look at yourself. Look at yourself. Recapitulate your actions and see how they impact the world around you, right? So I want to again take this down to having completed a relationship that was built on, uh, to some degree, an addictive cycle with a um, spiritual veneer over it. <clears throat> so we came into the relationship just off kilter. I, what was my truth is I wanted monogamy and commitment and that, that particular framework where I could play the long game. And uh, what ended up happening is we were both, we end up, instead of being in our truth out of the gate, we end up trying each other on sort of, you know, like, do these pants fit me? Um, And had a lot of fun in the meantime. So yay for fun. I would say nothing wrong with that, but we were having, we had sex the first night and then we just continued in that sexual area. So it was creating this like intimacy place, but it was out of context. Okay. So if you meet somebody and you're both in the examination of committed relationship, if you're lined up in that place, that person's like, I'm ready to offer myself to relationship. And I I am hoping to have a partner, a long-term partner and to get married. I don't know all the logistics and you're like, me too. That's a great place to like dive in, explore each other and see if there's chemistry and compatibility there. When you start a relationship based on one person coming in, having a lot of baggage and having been hurt, and it's not to say that I don't have my baggage and been hurt, um, the whole relationship is going to be based on the intensity of these triggers that come up, you know, of trying to get your needs met. It's like the needs met bureau of bullshit stories that come up that you're just like, I'm not good enough. I'm too much. You can't handle me. And then you're like, you're not actually relating to the person. You're relating to the story of the person you've made up in your head that they hope hope you, that you hope they could possibly be to soothe all your childhood wounds. Uh, yeah, none of us get married being like, you know what? I can't wait to be your surrogate parent and just like raise you. That's going to be amazing. Hopefully, hopefully with hearts and minds, we're engaging in relationship because we know we're going to grow with this partner. That growth is not always going to be comfortable, okay? It's not going to always be like, oh, this is so amazing. But there is a level of a vow of commitment. There's an underlying current that carries you. Well, 
suffice to say, um, three months went by and um, he had a, a pattern in his system where on the fourth month, the relationships come to an end. So sure enough, the fourth month rolled around and I was ready to go for the long haul and just deal with whatever was coming up. But I wasn't quote unquote, and, and these are my words and my bias, I wasn't doing it right. Like, he just couldn't provide me the love that I wanted. And so he got real with himself and just broke up with me. And it was just like, I feel like I'm in a relationship and I don't want to be in a relationship. Now, here's what I want to say about breaking up, (laughs) especially when you've engaged in an addictive pattern. Your body has been wired for the adrenaline rush, the ecstasy of the high and the, and the recovery from the low. So if you've been in a push pull relationship, the high and low, the breakup is going to echo that relationship. You're not necessarily going to be able to like break up, delete, block, and then just no contact, cold turkey out of the gate. Um, Because you do need a period of withdrawal to get it back into sobriety, to come back into peace, to come back into groundedness. And we didn't do that. We, I didn't talk for four days and then I came back and then inevitably we're physical with each other and it was all convoluted until, um, And often a lot of people do this, they create a scenario where they can't have an amical breakup, they need to demonize the other person. So they just devolve the breakup to the worst case scenario, where someone says something really cutting and mean. For instance, I want to feel in my bones, he he went to a wedding and he took away from the wedding, the bride said to him, uh, the bride's speech apparently included, I've loved a lot of guys in my life. I could love a lot of guys, but my husband is my man and I knew it in my bones. I'm I'm like puking in my mouth a little bit right now. (laughs) I'm just having a little bit of like internally violent, eruptive reaction to that. But cool. The my my partner who I was dating took that to mean like, oh, that's the barometer. That's how you know. That's it's a deep knowing. Like, you don't fucking know your ass from your elbow, you know? You don't know, you don't freaking have any, it's all you know is that you've been hurt. And so have I. Great. We, so here's the, here's the other magical thing about addictive relationships and really fantastic thing. It's even if you're a counselor, even if you've studied this shit extensively as I have, the, there's always an opportunity to, to vibrate in peace and in harmony and to come into your own knowing and to trust yourself and to trust your instincts. But whomever is vibrating, whoever has the most negative thought forms in the relationship, the person with the most baggage wins because to be in relationship with them, you have to go from the castle to the gutter. You got to go from the palace down to the gutter. You're like, hey, hang out in the gutter. I guess I'll come hang out with you and we can look up at the stars together. And that's the crazy thing about addictive relationship is you mistake it for connectedness for, oh, they get, we're going so deep together so fast. We just really get each other. You're in the gutter looking at the stars, kids, you know, but here's the fun part. The gutter is made of the same thing, same material as the castle, as the palace. They're made of the same thing. So it's a choice of which one you want to inhabit, which one you want to spend your time in. So if you're in relationship with somebody who has an addiction, you your addictions are going to come to life, right? Your love addictions, your fear of abandonment, you're not enough, you're I'm only for me, I'm only valuable if I'm a sexual object. Like your self-esteem is basically going to tank because here's here's the fun here's a fun fact. Is there is a collective idea that it's lonely at the top and that spirituality means being elevated and enlightened means, you know, you have to be a monk on a hill just by yourself, like just secretly masturbating, but not telling anybody. I'm on to you guys. Um, (laughs) I know me being, I'm being celibate. We know you're like devout. Good for you. Good, good for you and your shaved heads. But the, uh, the reality is that what if we say you're not lonely at the top, you're actually, your company is the ascendant masters and the angels and just the people who have, uh, who vibrate at the energy of peace and joy. Um, cause love, love is a, love is a lower vibration energy than peace and joy. It's actually, um, love can be really, uh, the reason that we ache with love is it's a distractor implant. It's something that we, we sell each other as a bill of sale. I love you. I possess you. 
And then we get in this like cycle of like wanting to be autonomous. I'm my own person, but I need you and I depend on you, but I don't want to depend on you. I don't want to be interdependent. And then we create all these systems um, to, you know, deal with the fact we're human and don't know what the fuck we're doing. So breaking the addictive cycle is basically a decision to say, "Mm, I'm not going to be sick so I can fit in. Because everybody's like, oh, I have an addiction. You're like, me too. Let's play go fish with our addictions. <laughs> you know, let's amp up the addiction cycle here. And I want to talk about addiction as abuse, um, whether it's love addiction, sex addiction, or substance abuse. Um, the addictive cycle, again, I've mentioned it before in other podcasts, is there's a honeymoon period when you come into meeting somebody where it's just very, it's like rapture. That's like the injecting the heroin into the veins. Oh my God, rapture. You feel this rapture happen and you feel as if you've been saved and all your problems have been excommunicated from your body. And you're just like, Oh, and we, again, we do that with spiritual bypassing. Again, Ken Wilbur, spiritual bypassing, Google it, um, look into that shit. Okay. So we spiritual bypass through this inevitable rapture, but then this pressure, this internal, all the things that were our shadows we're not looking at creates this internal pressure inside of us where we, we don't want to, we don't want to feel it, resisting it. I don't want to, don't, don't look at me. Don't make me look at myself. I don't want to like face, I don't want to face my fears, false evidence appearing real. And then the rupture happens, the violent rupture, the breakup happens, the, uh, the physical abuse can happen in the relationship, the cheating on somebody happens, the polyamorous conversation of like, maybe monogamy is not the greatest expression of love. Uh, okay, because the paleo diet is so advanced, because that's what cavemen ate, makes total sense. You know, like evolve a little bit, evolve, get with the program, people. So the program being breakup ha- rehab brought to you by RebeccaFreedom.com available on Amazon. Okay, getting back to our regularly scheduled program. Um, So yeah, okay, so just examine where you are in your relationship. Are you in an addictive cycle? Are you repressing, suppressing, contorting yourself to be able to keep yourself in relationship? Are you um, are you in the fantasy mode? Um, And are you able to break free from the addictive cycle? Um, one of the feelings that we really feel we're in the addictive cycle is, um, if we have a sexual trauma, we feel I am drawn to partners who demand sex for me. I try to be understood by my partner, even when he or she doesn't care. I'm unable to attract a healthy partner who could be good for me. I go to any length to help a person I know that is not healthy for me. I think my relationship would end if we stopped having sex for a period of time. There is a, a please get into the book to be able to, um, sleuth out where you are in your addictive cycle and to heal the addictive cycle. Cause I talked about spirituality as a veneer, spiritual bypassing to heal the addictive cycle takes inner child work. And again, being able to partner with ourselves, being able to say, I am not responsible for my abusers. I'm not responsible if I had a, if I'm a survivor of incest if I had a uh, sexual boundary crossed, if I was emotionally abused, um, neglected, if again, like that little child in Whole Foods, just experience, experiencing her joy. And in that, mo- that moment, the mother couldn't handle it, said stop. And we integrate into that system. We come to a place of forgiveness and letting go. And one of the areas of where we can embody love. One of the ch- most challenging areas where we embody love is simply to let a partner go. Because that, my friends, is consent. That's true consent. It's not, again, where victims are violent. They re- they take what was perpetrated on them and they re-perpetrate it on somebody else. Where they are not only betraying their own boundaries, they're pushing that that sickness onto the other person playing, saying, please, won't you save me? Won't you save me? So to partner with yourself is to, again, do inner child work and revisit the areas where the wounding has sat. There are several ways to clear out the wounding. Sound healing is one of them. Um, but certainly I would say the structure that is the most important is to gauge, engage in psychotherapy and EMDR trauma trained therapist 
or a sex therapist is going to be best suited to help you uh, re-engage with that part of you, to feel your heart again, to know to that you can live in wholeness, you are not broken, um, that the again, the pattern that was given to you is not your fault. You don't have to hold others' hearts, minds, or points of view in your body. Another way to break the addictive cycle is to find a access consciousness practitioner and have them run bars on you to clear all points of view from this lifetime and other lifetimes. And of course, if you find yourself going through repetitive breakups, um, I encourage you to pick up breakup rehab, creating the love you want, and take yourself through the 12 steps to then uh, heal and start over stronger. Love and sex addiction can be very complicated issues if we are deep in our denial, if we have the place where we have not even integrated or become to realize this because suppression of these memories happens to be one of the biggest coping mechanisms where you don't even remember covert um, sexual abuse. And certainly some people repress it where they don't even feel the overt sexual abuse. But you see the dysfunction happen in the bedroom, in the relationships, in the continual um, destruction and sabotaging of close, intimate relationships that will reflect back to you your bright light, your beauty, and your wholeness. If you feel that you're struggling with sex addiction or love addiction, I invite you to reach out to me again at RebeccaFreedom.com. Thank you for taking time to listen to this. I hope it helped. Please share it with those you feel will benefit from it and be set free.